words of Mother Teresa, what can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. Confucius said that the strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. And we can see and we know that what happens in the home affects the whole world. Nowhere has God placed a more important grouping in your life than your family. You come in entirely vulnerable. And your family is where our greatest needs are met and sometimes our most deep wounds are dealt. Which is why we've been talking about this family recipe for a while. It's the first and most important institution, at least one of the most important that God's created. We talked about so far. Here's a refresher course if you haven't been here. Or if you have, and like me, don't remember <laughs> what we talked about last week. I had to re-memorize all of these ingredients that we've been looking at. We've been looking at the Bible and saying, okay, what are the ingredients, or at least some of the key ingredients that God has given us when we're dealing with our family life? We talked about first marriage. If family is the bedrock of society, marriage is the nucleus of the family. We talked about the ingredients of, do you remember any of them? I know you Detachment, the importance of leaving your father and mother and disconnecting that primary inner circle to create a new establishment, a new family when you get married. And not disconnection, but starting a new attachment. We talked about the importance of sex in marriage as, an, as a primary relational connector only in that context. And holiness, how we make our spouse be more like God over the course of a lifetime. Then we talked about parenting talked about the important ingredients of obedience to our parents when we're in the home. We talked about the importance of not provoking or angering or abusing or being harsh to our children. And then teaching our children. Table teaching, car conversations, pillow prayer. You've been trying any of those? We've been trying them. Hit and miss, but it's, it's helped. We talked about the importance of church life. The family and the church are two distinct entities, but when they work together, it's a powerful combination. Josh talked about the importance of attending church, just simply making it a priority to be involved in the life of the church, to growing relationships, influencing who your family members know, and then serving together. We talked about transitions, those key moments in life where it seems like everything is changing, and even our most solid foundation of our family unit can be ripped away from us. So having a storm shelter that is strong enough to withstand any kind of storm in life, even those closest to home. We talked about having a giveaway mentality like a father of a bride. Our highest role is not to keep our family members, it's to escort them to Jesus. We talked about last week money. If you weren't here, sorry you missed it. Amen. <laughs> the importance of uh, understanding <coughs> that God provides everything and yet we also have to work hard investing into what he does into his work and then uh, having a contentment with what he's given us and not going further in, into debt and digging ourselves up. Today is the last one of the series it's called Legacy. These have been up there all, all, all the whole series so if you missed the themes they, they've been bannered for us. Legacy most commonly refers to money or inheritance. If you take the idea of money and inheritance that you pass on to your loved ones after you die, we can take that a step further and say legacy really is taking all the riches of the past and bringing them to bear on the generations of the future. If you would just close your eyes with me for a moment or you can keep them open if it helps. But I want you to imagine your life. Imagine the end of your life and imagine what could be your legacy. What would you dream it to be? The riches of your past passed on to the generations of the future. Now I want you to think about that again and now think bigger. Whatever you thought about, raise the scale times 10. Think about what could be. Not just money. Maybe not even money. I'll tell you a story of a woman who is 
who lived in the early 1900s. Her name was Claudius. She had five kids. She dedicated those children to the Lord when they were born, and her fifth kid had a severe stutter. She told Granville, one day God is going to use you powerfully to, to, to speak to multitudes, and he's going to cure you of your stutter. Well, Granville grew up in this Christian home, but at 16 he decided to walk away. He really turned his life away from all the things that he had learned in his family and against God. And at 16, he was really into sports. He was really a good basketball player, and he was just kind of running the life of his, his teenage imagination until he got sick. He was in bed for five months. He had tuberculosis. So no sports, no anything activity. He was down. At that point, after five months, one of his family members took him to hear a revivalist preacher. If, you, if you've been around church for a long, long time, you might be familiar with that kind of revival meeting or evangelistic crusade. So they took him in, and in the course of that night, he was so sick he couldn't even get up to the preacher. He had to wait till the end. The preacher came to him, and when the preacher came to him, his family, he was so sick, they had to literally stand him up. And when the preacher prayed for him, he was healed instantly, and his stutter was totally gone. I almost stuttered when I said that. <laughs> stutter was totally gone. After that, Oral Roberts, Granville Oral Roberts, became a pastor. He served in rural Oklahoma for a number of years at a small congregation. And then he moved on to an international circuit where he was a traveling evangelist. He held great crusades. God did some miraculous healings. Some of you may have heard of the university that he founded called Oral Roberts University. I always thought it was a school for dentists. <laughs> but apparently it was founded because God in initiated this through him. He came under some criticism, actually, over the course of his life because there were so many powerful, miraculous things happening in his life that uh, people started giving lots of money. Uh, thousands, even tens of thousands of people came to the Lord. But there was some question of financial integrity. There were some questions of uh, his own personal lifestyle that really brought him into the spotlight. And he was a televangelist. So you know the more spotlight you have, the more criticism that comes. And in the words of one biographer, because of these events, Oral Roberts' legacy was a mixed one. We're going to look at the story of a famous person in history whose legacy is a bit mixed. There are some aspects woven into his legacy that may be surprising if you don't know the life of Moses, but we're going to look at Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, specifically chapter 4 and chapter 30. You've heard a good bit of chapter 4 read already for us. But I want to tell you a couple things about Deuteronomy. This is some biblical studies background. When you go to study a book of the Bible, one of the things that's helpful is to notice where it's placed in the Bible. That matters. It matters not just in the timing of history, but it also sometimes matters with what voice it is given. Deuteronomy follows, it's right toward the beginning, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's that, it's that fifth book. But the first three books, Genesis, Exodus, not Leviticus, Numbers, they all sweep through a lot of history. There's a lot of action, there's a lot of movement, covers many, 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 many generations in those books. And it brings us right to the point of Abraham's calling, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Joseph's in Egypt, slavery, Moses takes them out of slavery, they're going to this promised land, they've been wandering around the desert for a long time, and now they're just about to actually go into this promised land. And Deuteronomy is a long pause in the scripture before they go in. Deuteronomy doesn't really cover any amount of uh, chronological distance. Because it's this speech of Moses. Now, I want you to feel the intensity of the speech of Moses because this is the last speech Moses ever gets to give. As soon as he's done with this moment, he retires. He was, you could say, he was forced into retirement by the Lord. And he doesn't go across the river and into the promised land. He hands off the mantle to Joshua. And he goes to finish his life 
with the Lord by himself. And so he gets to talk to the people. He gets to tell them all these important things. It's his last speech. I'll read to you a few verses from Deuteronomy 30. You heard, and they'll come up on the screen here. Deuteronomy chapter, the first four chapters, he tells the story, tells the history of what has happened in the nation. And then he talks about um, the covenant with God. And then at the last couple chapters, he gives us encouragement for the future. So let's see if we can see some Deuteronomy. This is 30, starting with verse 15. This is just dripping with emotional intensity. Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to keep His commands and decrees and regulations by walking in His ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply. The Lord will bless you and the land that you are about to enter and occupy. But if your heart turns away, and if you refuse to listen, and if you're drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I'm warning you now, you will certainly be destroyed. You'll not live a long, good life in the land you're crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the land the Lord swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can I point out five important parts of this scripture and then see what it applies to our family legacy? The first part is he's telling the history, especially the first four chapters of Deuteronomy. He goes through a very lengthy redescription of all the stuff that's happened. Now, some of the people have been familiar with this history because they lived some of it. Some of the people were young enough that they didn't know a lot of it, or at least they didn't know it by personal experience. So Moses is belaboring the history. And if you're not a historian, that might sound boring to you. But it was very important to him. And then he actually tacks on to once he says, here's all of the history of what's happened to our people. He commands the group, pass this down to your children and your grandchildren. He says, don't let this slip away from your mind. Don't let this fade away from your heart. Keep it, preserve it, pass it down. You can imagine Moses was really intentional about this. So intentional, in fact, that we're still reading that history. It was preserved not just for two generations. It's still preserved. He calls them to worship the Lord. He says, in, in the future, you guys will be surrounded by all kinds of different people. And they will worship all kinds of different gods. And some of them might even mix in some of your god worship and do some, some of the religious stuff that you guys do. And you might want to do the same and mix in some of their religious stuff. And you might want to take some of the blessings that God has given you and you might want to turn your heart and attention onto those things and actually forget the Lord himself. Please make sure you worship the Lord. Listen to his voice. Walk with him. Obey him. Follow him. Such an important call during those moments of final legacy. And then he also says, um, by the way, I didn't do it all right. He confesses some of his own life. You know, if you know the life of Moses early on in Moses' life, he was a murderer. It's a great way to start your career in ministry, isn't it? Kill somebody? No. But he did. Then later on in his life, you can probably hear the resonance from the anger he lashed out in murder. Oh, I just made a connection there. Never realized before. To the anger he lashed out on the rock, which got him disqualified from leading into the future. He talks about it in Deuteronomy. 
This is an incredibly helpful insight for those of us who feel like, and listen, I know some of us through this series, you've been thinking, okay, great biblical ingredients, but my family is not right. It's not perfect. It's not the way I would want it to be. And you're dealing with feelings of regret and, and confusion and frustration. And maybe if I could start over knowing what I know now, I could make my family much better. But this is where we are. Listen, that's okay. One of the greatest legacies you can leave to your family is telling them the truth about your mistakes. As long as those truth about your mistakes lead toward your repentance and your acceptance of God's grace. Because they're going to need it. Whoever you're telling is not going to live a perfect life. And they're going to know. Huh. I know some of you who made some big mistakes. I remember what they said about that. That is going to free them to be honest and go to God. There are three questions that a legacy asks or, or someone begs for in a legacy. The first question is this. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And third, what do we value? I know we have, which I, I think is a real gift, we have people of all, all generations here. We have four or five generations represented in this room. I think that's a tremendous gift to each other. And some who are in a place where you're not asking legacy questions, you're not thinking about the future or the past, you're just living today. There are some who you're, you're at a stage where you're starting to wonder about the past and explore questions of where did I come from because you're making some key decisions and you want to know where, where the historical precedent lies. Some of you are on the end of the journey and you're really asking questions about your legacy. It's becoming clear that your decisions and your days are numbered. And you want to make the most of it. I think it's great. We have all kinds of generations here. One of the questions that begs a legacy to answer is, where did we come from? Did you know that we are not the most connected people to our roots? I mean, other places in the world are a little bit better than this. I read a, one, one survey said that 45% of American adults are first or second generation immigrants. Can you believe that? I, I don't even know if I can believe that. But you could probably imagine eight or nine generations ago, most of our relatives didn't live in the North American continent. We don't have rootedness and a sense of place and a sense of history like a lot of people around the world have. Regardless of what your position is on immigration and the stand that you take, no matter what it is, I think it's wise to season that with a touch of humility because Unless your Native American heritage is pretty, pretty strong, most of us are no more than six, seven, eight generation immigrants. So we have this sense of disconnection, and nowadays you can just create ex nihilo, a profile online, and create your own identity. Like, I'll just, I got a blank set of questions, I can just create my own history. Like, I don't even need to know who my parents were, or my grandparents were, I can create, even create my own image online. And there's just a sense of disconnect that I think people really get to have a hunger for the past. That's why Ancestry.com has two and a half million paying customers. They want to know where we came from. If you're leaving a legacy, one of the most helpful questions you can answer for those to come, your family or others, that doesn't just have to be your family, you influence other people's lives, is to tell them stories of your history. We've got to find ways of capturing these stories and retelling them, and then retelling them again, and maybe writing them down, and maybe finding creative ways to pass on tangible gifts so that these stories have a historical place in our family. I just really encourage you, no matter how old you are, find those stories and keep them and preserve them and pass them down. It'll be a tremendous gift to those who follow you, and not just your story. But we can take a person's life and we can help them see I am a part of this history that goes all the way back to what Moses said. That family story is our family story. That's our spiritual legacy. So helping them connect with the stories of Scripture as part of my family story is a tremendous gift. Where are we going? 
where are we going? Did you ever wonder that? As a, as a kid or when you became an adult or when you started making decisions? Do you ever wonder if your family had some sort of theme? If there was some sort of general direction that we're supposed to be at? Like, am I just, am I just blank slating my life? Or is there some sort of history that comes to bear when I make decisions and directions that guides me towards some sort of destiny? That's a history question. This is a destiny question. Where are we going? Is there any continuity to the... Life of generations to generations, or is just all on our own. This too, you can help by connecting your family story to the bigger picture. About once a month, or maybe once a quarter, I sit down and I do my weekly planning, but I go backwards and I start with a several sheets of just life check. And it starts by literally page after page. The first page says the cosmic story, and it talks about it. There's just four sections. The whole scope of history, we're in the redemption part, and my little family story is right somewhere in there. And then I flip over to the family story, and that says, in the bigger Osborne picture, this is what I think God's theme is in my family and what we are meant to live for, and, and these are the themes. And then my personal story, what I think the themes of my life are, what God wants to do through my life, and then that boils down to what am I doing right now, what checklist do I need to make. It's really good to help our family generations realize you fit into a bigger picture. Listen, if we don't do this, we will fall into the, the trap of thinking that people just come into our family, they're born, they're married into, they're adopted into our family, and then they just die, they're plucked out, the tragedy of their broken or divorced takes us, and we just feel like the splintering effect just takes our family away from us. This is not the story. In Jesus, there is a destiny, a common destiny. And those who have died in the faith are already at the end. But we are going somewhere, and we are led by a promise that we follow in faith. Last question is, what do we value? Maybe a more Bible way to say that is, what do we worship? Although we don't talk about worship like that, it's the same thing. What do we value? I know you live in neighborhoods and have coworkers. Many of them would check Christian on a survey, but if you looked at what they valued, that value would be way down the might blend in a little bit of your worship stuff into your life. And you might want to blend in a little bit of their worship stuff into your life. But the greatest gift you can give, the legacy that will last, is to be able to say what we value most in this family is Jesus. Oral Roberts pastored in Oklahoma church rural, small, for several years. A boy named Tommy went to that church and he got saved at 13. Tommy went on to be a pastor. He felt called to be a pastor. And as he got older, he just felt this stirring that God had more for his life. And so he did a missionary stint in India. And then after that, he came back and God really opened up a huge ministry of evangelism and global revival that happened through this guy. And so he started traveling internationally. He started traveling, especially the Caribbean islands. He was in over 70 countries. And then the famous evangelist Tommy Lee Osborne did powerful things through the Holy Spirit. Became well known. <clears throat> One day while he was at a revival leading in one of the Caribbean islands, in a nearby village, there was a lady named Amalia who was dying with tuberculosis. The doctors had said, there's no cure for you, just go home and finish out your life. Well, she heard about this Osborne, and something inside her stirred, though neither she nor her family were Christians. She begged her family, take me to this guy. So her family hauled her over to the, to the tent, to the revival meeting. And as she's hearing Tommy talk about Jesus, something in her is resonating with it. And she said to God in her heart, God, if you would heal me from my disease, I will serve you for the rest of my life. She said electricity 
ran through her body that night. And she went home. And she got well. She reversed the doctor's prescription. She got better and better and better. Instead of worse and worse and worse. And she was fully restored to her health. And so she made good on her promise and served the Lord. First one in her family. Amen. Not long after that, her daughter, Lydia, who was married to a man moved to New York. The man, the, her husband, moved to New York, took a job. But Lydia was just terrified. Moving from the Caribbean to New York City is hard enough. But to move not knowing anything about the culture. So Amalia encouraged her daughter Lydia to follow in faith. Go with your husband. Trust the Lord. Do not be afraid. So Lydia joined her husband and took their young kids and moved to New York City. One of their young kids was named Sunny, and she grew up with that family story ringing in her ears. So when she was called, sensed God's calling to be a missionary, she was eager to follow, but life didn't really work out like that. She got married, and they had a number of kids, and they just struggled to, you know, make ends meet, put the family recipe together and keep it from falling apart. So that calling just got postponed and postponed, and they were teachers, and so they just finished their career, careers and teaching, and once they retired, it's when that calling opened up again. And like the mother before her, Sunny said, okay, we're going to follow that calling. So they moved across an ocean to finish out their lives as missionaries of the gospel of Jesus. A couple years later, their youngest daughter went over to visit them, and while she was there on the field, she felt the calling. And she didn't want the calling, but she, she felt Jesus was saying, leave everything and come be a missionary. And so she put that value into action and left everything and went to Africa to run an orphanage, which is where I met her. When I saw her faith, it inspired my faith. And I said, I gotta marry her. <laughs> and then we moved to become missionaries to northern Indiana. So maybe if it wasn't for Claudius dedicating her son Granville to the Lord, Michael and Lily never would have been born. Maybe if it wasn't for T.L. Osborne following God's call for something more. Maybe if it wasn't for Lydia taking a step of faith to go to a place that she didn't know, trusting the Lord. Your actions will leave a legacy that will <coughs> echo into the future. story. Deuteronomy is Moses' final speech. You know who was standing right behind Moses in the vice president role at that speech? Joshua. Fast forward one book and 24 more chapters in Joshua 24. Joshua has this moment where he calls everybody together and he says, listen, I know we're in the land. Do you remember what we were told? <clears throat> We're going to have all kinds of choices of who to worship, what to value, what your family is going to stand for. In fact, you have to make your own decision. You decide what's best for you to worship. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's an epic milestone in the family legacy, isn't it? As for me and my house. Whatever else is to be said of us. We will serve the Lord. I can preach to you, but you can make your own decisions of what you value. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think there might be some here today who this is this is what you want to be your legacy, whether it's been or not, or whether it is, and you just haven't said it out loud. That's what you want to say. That's it. That's it. That's the phrase. That's the phrase that captures my family legacy. As for me and my house, we'll, Choose this day who you will serve, and I don't really have a 
us saying that, but for whatever stay I have. <coughs> Is there anybody that wants to stand up and say that today? You got the stand-up part right, but you didn't say it. Some of you have stood but haven't said. Go ahead, we're not rushed. Here's the next challenge. Said it in church, say it out there. Somehow, somehow say it out there. Maybe it's just go home and post on your Facebook. Today I stood up and I said this. Maybe it's just writing your maybe writing your kids, or your grandkids, or your nieces, or your nephews, or your students, or writing them a note and saying, as, as one of my legacies, I just want to pass down. This is what matters. <clears throat> Maybe it's finding a gift and giving them a gift and signifying that concept in a gift. Maybe it's doing what Casey and Leah Sprunger have done, and that's from their house. I asked them if they'd bring it in. And this stands at their doorway of their house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a powerful statement to anybody who enters their home. You don't have to ask questions. As you go to Aaron and Carissa's reception, I think there will be that there it is. <laughs> I love a good team. <laughs> There are uh, small plaques that you can go, go over and write, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and take it home and hang it somewhere today. Or you can just write Joshua 24, 15 and wait for people to ask. Or you can just write, as for me and my house, or we will serve the Lord, or just put a big star on there, and when people go, what's the star for? You can tell them, but it's a way of saying. Whatever else is my legacy, I don't know if I'll have a lot of money to pass down. I don't know if I'll have great, amazing stories to tell about being a missionary. But what I want you to know about me is what I value most, and that's Jesus. You can't buy a better legacy. Jesus, that goes for us. That goes for our church. It goes for our families. The key ingredient, Lord, is you. And so, we just invite you to continue to work out your grace daily, in the nitty gritty of our family life, in whatever form that takes, whatever shape our family's in, whatever dynamic or description applies to us, you are the consistent essential ingredient. We ask you to do your work, and we will continuously give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week at 10 o'clock, now may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go, you are sent.